We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesusistherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesusistherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. I'm always fascinated when I come across people who tell me I don't believe in God. Or they tell me I've lost my faith in God. I used to believe in God, now I just don't. And, um, and so I usually inquire as to why. Why don't you believe in God? Why have you lost your faith in God? Tell me about that experience. And strangely enough, whenever you start digging and inquiring, I hear the same answers almost every time. There there are a few answers that I'm going to hear one version or another of this answer. Many times someone will say to me, well, I had a bad experience in church. I used to be in church. Every time doors were open, I used to, you know, I had a bad experience. To which I reply, join the club. I've had hundreds of bad experiences in church. If you've been in church for very long, you've probably had a bad experience. If you've been with any other human being for very long, you've probably had a bad experience. Um, I usually tell them, you know, I've had bad experiences at the barber shop. I haven't given up on haircuts. Maybe I change barbershops if the experience was bad enough. I've had bad experiences at restaurants. I've obviously not given up on eating, right? You're seriously going to tell me you have lost your faith in God because you had a bad experience in church? I, well, I prayed. And I asked God to do this or do that, and God didn't answer my prayer. So you know what? I'm done with it. Okay. Try this scenario on. Teenage Susie comes in from school, and she says, I prayed for Bill to ask me to the prom, and God didn't answer my prayers. So I'm done with it. Well, guess what? Teenage Susie's mother says, I prayed and asked Bill, God did not let Bill ask you, and he answered my prayers. So I believe in God. Am I right? You understand the dilemma God has here when he deals with fickle human beings? You got a guy that's praying for rain because his drops are his crops are drying up and his neighbor's praying for pretty weather because his daughter's getting married outside tomorrow. I mean, I know God can do anything, but let's get real. God has a problem on his hands because he's dealing with human beings. And you're seriously going to tell me you have lost your faith in the Almighty God because he did not answer a prayer based on your silly whims. So how do we really know God? How do we really learn who God is? What God likes, what he dislikes, what God wants for me, what God wants from me, what God requires. How can I really know? These are questions that people have spent lifetimes pondering. And and I'm, I'm always amazed at how many experts they are that tell us about God, who God is, what God likes, what God doesn't like. And let me tell you something about the experts. Experts, no matter what type of religion you're talking about, experts will almost always use some type of sacred writing as their guide. Whether that's the Bible for Christians or whether that's the Torah for uh, the Jews or whether that's the Watchtower for Jehovah's Witness or whether that's the Book of Mormon for somebody else, we always have something that we use as our guide for truth, and this is who God is. Here's the problem with only using a sacred text as your guide. Let's take the Bible, for example, because that's the one probably most of us are most familiar with. Um, So another excuse unbelievers give for not believing in God is they say, the Bible, you know, I've read the Bible. The Bible contradicts itself. That's the problem I have. Guess what? They're right. 
They're very right. Don't dismiss them. They're right. Most Christians will tell you that the Bible is their guide. This is the book. This is, the, this is, this is my guide. Many Christians will tell you that they believe that everything in this Bible is true. Some will tell you, I believe every word in this Bible is literal. Don't run out on me yet. Anyone who tells you, I believe every word in this Bible is literal, has never seriously read the Bible. Every word in the Bible is not literal. I'll give you an example. Jesus would say, why are you trying to get the splinter out of your brother's eye and you've got a log in your own eye? I've never seen anyone with a log in their eye. Never. Because it's not literal. It's figurative. Jesus would say things like, you, you gag at a gnat and you swallow a camel. Have you ever seen anyone swallow a camel? It's not literal. Jesus was a master of using figurative language to, 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 to show us a great big truth. Jesus would say things like, there was a king and he hired two servants. No, he didn't. There was no king that did that. Jesus made it up. He told stories. We call them parables. It's how Jesus talked. He would tell stories and then he would say, now here's the lesson to learn from that. He would illustrate things. Everything you read is not literal. You say, okay, all right, I, I, I get that. I, I can buy that. But when you, you said everything's not true. Everything in the Bible is not true. Let me explain. The Sadducees, the Pharisees would follow Jesus around because they were always trying to discredit him. And so they would say things like, you are not the son of God. In fact, you're a devil. That's a lie but it's in the Bible. Everything in the Bible is truly stated. It's just not true. If I pick up the Bible and I read, here's the Pharisees, and says, well, they're the Christian group. They're the religious leaders, so they must be true. And they said, oh, he's not the son of God. In fact, he's a devil. Who? You just believed a lie that's in the Bible because liars said it. Everything in the Bible is truly stated, but everything is not true. I'll give you one more example real quick. Have you ever read um, over in the book of Ecclesiastes? Or Lamentations too, also really, but let me give you a little bit of Ecclesiastes. Let me, let me find it. Let me look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. Um, King Solomon was considered the wisest man who ever lived. He was the wisest king Israel ever had, great king over Israel, wrote the Proverbs, wrote so much wisdom. He, he was all of these things. How many know even good people have bad days? After his kingship, King Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. If you ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's almost one big lie because King Solomon had really bad days. He was, you're reading the, you're reading the tirades of a broken, depressed if not suicidal man. And he's, his therapy is to write. He writes these things. Let me give you some of the things that he writes. Here's, here's some of Solomon's writings. Everything has already been decided. It was known long ago what each person would be, so there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. The more words you speak, the less they mean, so what good are they? In the few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our days can best be spent? Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what will happen on this earth or after we're gone? Who knows? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. Over in, in chapter uh, 9, he says, This too I carefully explored. Even though the actions of godly and wise people are in God's hands, no one knows whether God will show them favor. The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether righteous or wicked, good or bad. 
ceremonial clean or unclean, religious or irreligious, good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. It seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate, already twisted by evil. People choose their own mad course, for they have no hope. There is nothing ahead but death anyway. There is only hope for the living. There's nothing, it doesn't matter. Live. I mean, it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter. Believe in God. Don't believe in God. It don't matter because all we're going to do is live and die and it's all over. And, and, and the whole book is like that. He's depressed. He's pouring. What he's doing, honestly, if I tell you what he's doing, he's worshiping because that's what worship is. Read the Psalms. The psalmist does everything but Cuss God out. I mean, he, why are you not listening to me? Are you sitting? Are you deaf? He, he goes on tirades. And then in the next minute, he's saying, but I will praise you in the darkness. I will praise you. Read Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, God, I'm sick of these people. I've preached to them. They won't listen. I'm done. I'm not saying anything else. About three verses later, he says, but it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I have to preach. Everything in the Bible is not true. It's all truly stated. But we're dealing with human beings that wrote these, and they wrote, yes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One more quick example. Look at Peter and Paul. Peter wrote part of the New Testament. Paul wrote over half the New Testament. They come together at one time. They get in a big argument, in a big fight. The Bible says there was sharp disputations between them because they were arguing about whether or not the Jews should sit at the table and fellowship with Gentiles. One of them had to be wrong. They were not always right. They were humans, and they went through things. They, they recorded these things for us, and, and you know, we have these things to lead us and God, but we have to take the good, bad, and the ugly. We can't pick out the part we like and, and jump up and build doctrines and theologies on it and, and, and preach that without taking the whole Bible and understanding what it's for. This is the problem with saying you know, that this sacred text, whether, whatever it is, this is my only my only frame of mind for God. Um, others, others will say, well, I worship the God of nature. I, the nature is my sanctuary. And you know what? I so get that because I love to look at the Smoky Mountains and worship God. Only God could build this. I loved standing at the Grand Canyon and looking at that and thinking, God, this is your handiwork. This is amazing. I love to go to the beach. You could find me there a lot of times, sitting out on the beach park pier or sitting at the swing, looking out over the ocean. That's where I go to pray, to meditate, to worship, to sing because nobody hears me there. I go there, and that is my I love that. I love, I love to think about the ocean. In the Bible, it says this in the book of Job. It says, God, you say to the ocean, come this far and no further. That still amazes me to look at the Gulf of Mexico, this vast body of water, and it stops two miles south of here at Beach Boulevard. It just comes to an end, except in Katrina. And then it comes a little further. But can you imagine this water just stops because God said that's far enough. So I get that. I get the God of nature. I love to worship the God of nature. But if the God of nature is all I worship... Let me try to give you Roger's example of what that means. That's like flying into New York City at night, or in any major city, really. Have you ever flown into a major city at night? It's beautiful. There's nothing but lights twinkling down below. And, I mean, it looks like heaven, the majesty of it. You fly into, you fly into that city, and it just looks gorgeous. But would it be fair to say if that's your only view of New York City, your view may be a little skewed, yeah. right? I mean, he, even Hank Williams Jr., he says, send me to hell or New York City. It'd be about the same to me. Not, not that I'm using his theology because he wants heaven to be a lot like Dixie, and I'm not sure I want that either. So, but if all you know of New York City is to look at the majesty from your viewpoint up here, and you've never walked the inner cities and saw the poverty and the crime and the hate of any major city, any minor city, any, if you, then there's more to New York City than looking at the nature, looking at the beauty, looking at the splendor. So 
it's not fair to say I worship the God of nature and, and that's your viewpoint of God. It's a viewpoint, but it's not the viewpoint. All right, so, so how, how am I supposed to know God? How do I know his likes, his dislikes, his wishes for me? If it's not the church, because I get disappointed there, if it's not the Bible, because, well, everything, I don't know what I, you know, I don't know there. Uh, if it's not nature, what is it? I think God pondered the same question. I believe God, God's, how can I show mankind who I am? How can I show them what I like, what I dislike? And this is how God chose to resolve that dilemma. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, he says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let me give you a little something. This is not a play on words. This is a, this is a very accurate translation. Whenever you see the Word, put Jesus, because Jesus is the Word. In the beginning, Jesus already existed. Go back and read in Genesis when they created the world. He said, we created them. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He, they existed. In the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Nothing was created except through him. Jesus, the Word, gave life to everything that was created. His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. It can never extinguish it. Let's read on. Um, in verse number, let's see, 14. So the word, Jesus, became human, and he made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified him about when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said someone's coming after me who's far greater than I am. He existed long before me. From his abundance, we've all received one gracious blessing after another, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the unique one who is himself God. He's near to the Father's heart, and listen to this. He has, he has revealed God to us. He has revealed God to us. Jesus would later say it like this. If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. For me and my Father are one. How can I know God? I look at Jesus. I look at Jesus. I like to say that Jesus was God in coveralls. He sort of snuck into the human race, camouflaged as a baby. God said, I want people to know me. I don't want to be some abstract up in the God, omnipotent Father somewhere in the universe, if thou knowest and couldest know and please and do. I want people to know me. And furthermore, I want people to trust me. I want people to love me. I want, but how can, when everybody thinks that I'm a misty white this in heaven, or the, I want people to know who I am. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sneak into the human race looking just like one of them. Just like one of them. And I will show them who I am, what I'm like, what I, what I want to do for them, what I want from them, I'll show them. They'll think I'm one of them. They'll think I'm one of them. You've seen my father, you've seen me. The scripture says God became flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that cool? God became flesh. So now we return to our original question. Who is God? How can I know who God is, what he likes, what he dislikes? What does he expect of me? How does he expect me to act? The answer, Jesus Christ. You want to know God? Get to know Jesus. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, read the red. That's what Jesus said. That's the words of Jesus. Read the gospel. See what Jesus did. You, you, want, to, you want to know God? Get to know Jesus. How does God treat people? Look how Jesus treated people. How does God see people? How did Jesus see people? How does God love people? How did Jesus love people? If you want to truly know the character of God and who God is, it's not rocket science. Look at Jesus. Me and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
You don't, have to, you don't have to wonder. You don't have to speculate. You don't have to try to use your imagination. It's, it's, it's this way. So when I, I look at Jesus and I study his life, I don't know what, what you find in that. My first thought is, oh, my God, what a relief. What a relief. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus hung out with sinners. He didn't just preach to them. He hung out with them at center parties. So much so, they called him a glutton and a wine bibber. I mean, can't you see Jesus gnawing on a chicken leg and giving high fives, and they probably told knock-knock jokes. And, he, he, and they say he, he's a friend of sinners. He's not just trying to get them on the right path and teach them the law. He's hanging out with them. He's, 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 his best friends are filthy mouth fishermen and tax collectors who are notorious thieves. They're the scum of society. Nobody hangs out with tax collectors. He's his best friend. He's walking around with this little posse of guys. And, 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 and my thought is, is, if Jesus chose them for his very best friends, maybe he could love me. Maybe he would even like me. I mean, what a relief that Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. <laughs> to know God is to know Jesus. And when I look at Jesus, I think, oh, my God. It's so easy to love you. I'm not having to wonder what you, wonder if I'm you know, following all the rules. And I, so, so are you saying, Pastor, if, if I want to know what God is really like, all I have to do is look at Jesus? No, I'm not saying it. Jesus said it. I'm just reading it. Don't believe it because I'm telling you something. Truth's not what I say it is. Truth is Jesus. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John wrote one time, Jesus came into the world so that we may know what God is like. That's, that was his purpose in coming. So now that leaves us with one final question to answer. Have you seen Jesus? lately? I mean, really seen Jesus, not what religion says about him, not what some preacher says about him. Church, we have something that we're so blessed with. We have a group of people who didn't write some theory about God. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They spent every day with Jesus. They sat around the campfire gnawing on chicken legs with Jesus. They had the foresight to write down the things he would say, the things he would do, when he would go into the temple and throw a tirade and kick over tables and throw up chairs and whip people. They wrote it down. Jesus had a bad day today. You know? Man, you know, they, they wrote this stuff down. I would probably have a hard time getting my mind around Jesus died for my sins and okay, I kind of believe it. I want to believe. Let me, let me give you a quick example and I'm going I'm to wrap this up. Let me see. I'll pick on my friend Harvey. Harvey's my friend. We walk together. We play golf together. We talk together. We eat together. We, we're, we're good friends. We hang out. Harvey comes to me one day and he says, listen, I need to tell you something. I'm about to be killed. And I'm going to die. There's some, there's some people that's going to murder me. When you hear this, don't. Yeah, this is probably realistic. <laughs> but he says, when you hear this, listen, don't get too upset because... I'm coming back. <laughs> Three days, I'll be back. To which I'm going to respond, Harvey, you've been working too hard. <laughs> now, come on. Come with me. I have a doctor friend that's going to give you something, and you're going to be okay. That's the way I'm going to, I mean, when you tell me that, that's where we're going. We're going, I'm telling you, if I had to put you in a straitjacket, we're going. 
And that's where many people are with the gospel. Okay, yeah, Jesus died. He rose again, right? Okay, y'all get together on Easter and do this. And that's where most people are. But when three days later, my doorbell rings, and I open the door, and he says, let's go to Cracker Barrel. I'm hungry. I will follow that man the rest of my life. Whatever you tell me, you have got me. I'm serious. When a man can predict his own death and his resurrection, and the disciples have all given up because they watched him be murdered. They watched his bloody body beyond death. I mean, tore to where he was unrecognizable. They watched him buried in a tomb, and three days later, they're out on their boats, and they look up, and he's sitting on the beach cooking breakfast for them, saying, come on, guys, I'm hungry. You've got my loyalty for the rest of my life. I don't care what anybody says. You are my God, and I am your servant. Whatever you say, I'm with you. I have watched you. And these men, watched. it wasn't one or two. It was, it was many. It was the whole New Testament. These men are writing. They, 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 they lived it, and they recorded it. And so I believe it, not because it's written in some book, because, but I, I, lit, I believe it because I know these are the people. History records these things. And so I, these people, they, 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 they walked this out. I am so thankful that I'm no longer bound by somebody's list of rules, some church doctrine or creed that somebody made up somewhere, some preacher's pet peeve, but I am unconditionally, um, overwhelmingly loved by my creator. And I know this. Why? Because he became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul, Paul wrote, Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world through me might be saved. He, he wrote and he explained, he, he explained, Jesus said, come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy, my burden's light. It's, it's okay, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus said, I am the great physician. I did not come for the well. I came for the sick. I came for the sick. And if somebody is telling you that because you're sitting in church this morning in a suit and tie and singing and praising and listening to a preacher that you're any better than a prostitute standing on the corner, get up and leave because they're telling you a lie. Jesus said that I created them in my image just like I created you. And in fact, if you really want to know the truth, they're closer to going to heaven than you are. Because both of you are sin sick. They know they're sin sick. You don't think you are. So, so, so they're closer than you are. Jesus said, get this thing right. Get this one right. Jesus loved the unlovable. He loved the outcast and the underdog. It's no wonder. Let me, let, one more thing. Paul, Paul wrote about Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus, a unique encounter with Jesus. But Paul, when he first started writing about Jesus, he described himself. He said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I kept the law blameless. I was perfect in keeping it. He wasn't perfect, but he, was, he knew that he kept the law like no man's business. And he said, that's who I am. I'm Paul. Later, after, after studying the life of Jesus, Paul would write, I'm Paul. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. A little while later in Paul's life, he writes, I'm Paul. I'm the least of the disciples. A little while later, he writes, I'm Paul, not worthy to be called a disciple. And near the end of his life, Paul writes, Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> I must decrease that he may increase. The more we learn about Jesus, the more we realize that all I have to do to have a relationship with Jesus is acknowledge my, my need for him, my great, great need for him. What a relief. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the Donate button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and have a very blessed day.